One uh, conspiracy theory that I subscribe to is that corporate media headlines are created by the use of some sort of random current event buzzword generator. And I'm beginning to think that journalists and news anchors themselves personally are created in a laboratory through a similar process. And this theory was further legitimized over the weekend when CNN published an article with the following headline. Joe Rogan's use of the N-word is another January 6th moment. Now, this would have been the perfect headline if only they'd found a way to jam a climate change reference in there as well. As it stands, I have to grade it an 8 out of 10. Pretty solid work, though. CNN was embarrassed by the mockery that followed, and they soon changed the headline to why shrugging off Joe Rogan's use of the N-word is so dangerous. Yes, it is quite dangerous to shrug at a word. The most dangerous kind of shrug of all, in fact. Uh, but this headline is, is still very stupid. Sadly, it lacks the comedic punch of the first headline. Sequels rarely live up to the originals, especially in the comedy genre. But the article itself remained unchanged. And it's worth reading some of this. Here's what it says. The podcaster Joe Rogan did not join a mob that forced lawmakers to flee for their lives. He never carried a Confederate flag out inside the U.S. Capitol Rotunda. No one died trying to stop him from using the N-word. But what Joe Rogan and those that defend him have done since videos, clips of him uh, using the N-word surfaced on social media is arguably just as dangerous as what a mob did when they stormed the U.S. Capitol on January 6th last year. Of course, by the way, nobody died trying to stop the Capitol rioters either. But who has time for such minor details? Things like the truth, who has time for that? Nobody does. It continues, Rogan breached a civic norm that has held together since World War II. It's an unspoken agreement that we would never return to the kind of country we used to be. That agreement revolved around this simple rule. A white person would never be able to publicly use the N-word again and not pay a price. Rogan has so far paid no steep professional price for using a racial slur that's been called the nuclear bomb of racial slurs. It may even boost his career. That's, why some, that's, a, that's what some say happened to another white entertainer who was recently caught using the word. It's a sign of how desensitized we've become to the rising levels of violence, rhetorical and physical, in our country that Rogan's slur was treated as the latest racial outrage of the week. But once we allow a white public figure to repeatedly use the foulest racial epithet in the English language without experiencing any form of punishment, we become a different country. We accept the mainstreaming of a form of political violence that's as dangerous as a January 6th attack. Now, it's hard to know where to begin. First, we have the, the casual way that words and physical violence are equated. Rhetorical violence, as the author puts it. Uh, it may be hard for those of us raised on these sticks and stones may break my bones philosophy to understand how any adult person, especially a man, and I think this article was written by an alleged man, could actually claim with any kind of straight face that a word has done violence to him. But what you have to understand is that we live in the age of psychological man, where a person's emotional and psychological comfort is considered to be the number one priority. Emotional is emotions, is, they're not just on par with physical well being, but actually they're prioritized over it. This is why, for example, a person who feels distraught over their body, their biological identity, is encouraged to mutilate their body for the sake of their psychological self identity, rather than working to change their psychological self identity to better comport with their bodies. Your, your psychological self identity, your emotional well being, that is the number one most important thing. In this context, you see how a word or idea or opinion or joke which causes emotional discomfort becomes an even worse form of violence than a bullet to your head or a blade to your stomach. But there's something else going on here, too. He says that there's a, a social contract, a social norm that we've all agreed to, which declares that a white person can never say this certain word in any context. Last night, singer India Ari was on The Daily Show um, continuing her campaign against Joe Rogan, and she made a similar point. Listen. When you know you're doing it, and like you said in your monologue, if a person keeps doing it, is that when we call them a racist? So if you know you're doing it and you keep doing it, I would say that is a racist. And so for me, when I think about, <sighs> I want to be nice. I was going to say this name that I'm tired of saying. But for me, when I think about Joe Rogan, I think, I think that he is being consciously racist. 
I mean, since the early 1900s, we've had an agreement in our society that we don't say the word or or you have mm-hmm. to suffer the consequences. Right. And so saying it and then being like, what are you going to do? Oh, sorry, I didn't mean that. Or I, I didn't understand there was no context under which I should say it. I don't believe that. I think he knew there was no context. I think that's why he was saying it, because it got a rise out of people. That's why he would say it. He knew that it was inappropriate. And I think the fact that, the fact that he did it repeatedly and was conscious and knew, I think that is being racist. I like how she pretends she didn't want to say Joe Rogan's name. I, don't, I, I told myself I wasn't going to say his name. That's the only reason you're being interviewed. The whole reason you're on The Daily Show is to talk about Joe Rogan. Like, no one else, no one wants to talk to India Ari for any other reason, okay? Uh, that's the whole reason you're there, is to talk about Joe Rogan. And by the way, uh, we should also mention with, with uh, Trevor Noah that he, the, you know, he's, he's very much been part of this effort to cancel Joe Rogan. And, uh, uh, but you, you may have seen some of the screenshots f- the circulating on Twitter from several years ago when uh, Trevor Noah was first announced as the replacement for... Um, for uh, for The Daily Show, for Jon Stewart, all of these jokes that he had made in his past came to the surface. And there was this cancel campaign against Trevor Noah. And guess who came to his defense? None other than Joe Rogan. Joe Rogan came out and said, hey, it was just a joke. Everyone back off. And to repay that, Trevor Noah flips it around and uh, joins the mob against him because that's what these people are are made of on the left. Now, we're told that there's this rule that we all agreed to. The problem is that we did not all agree to this rule. I, I didn't agree to it. I don't agree to it. I'm a part of society also, and I haven't signed any social contract, which declares that the right to use a word, any word, depends on your skin pigment or your country of origin. I don't agree to any rule which allows a member of one racial group to say a word 6,000 times a day if they want, while a member of another group cannot utter it in any context at all, no matter what. I don't agree to any rule which says that context doesn't matter when it comes to language. Context always matters. You cannot know what anyone is saying or understand anyone's meaning if you ignore context. Context is always important. In fact, she she, uh, contradicts herself in what she's saying right there because she says, oh, uh, he he used the word that he knew was offensive and he said it because he was trying to get a rise out of people. Okay, well, If you think that was the context, that he was trying to get a rise out of people and he was just saying it because it's offensive and he's trying to get attention, I don't know if that's true or not. But if that's true, that means it's not racist. That means his intention was not to be racist. It was just to get attention or to be offensive for the sake of being offensive. Now, you can say what you want about someone doing that, but it's not racist. It's just it's that's the motivation, according to you. But the context doesn't matter. I also have not consented to whatever consequences CNN or India Ari or Trevor Noah, you know, think ought to be doled out to the violators of this agreement that I never signed. I don't agree to any of it. Most everyone in the country has not agreed to any of this. And that's because it's not our rule. It's not society's rule. It's their rule. The leftist elite have come up with these social directives, these kind of cultural regulations And they demand adherence and will attempt to punish anyone who does not adhere. What we have to understand is that to the leftist elite, their social edicts and ordinances are the most important rules, the most sacred law, the only law, really. This is part of the reason why they've given up on enforcing the actual written law, the law that says you can't do stuff like, you know, rob and kill people. Partly they've abandoned that kind of law and order because they want to destabilize civilization, but also their heart isn't in it. All that matters to them is that you follow their rules. Rules against hurting and killing people. I mean, physically hurting and killing people, not emotionally hurting and killing them. They've been in place in every civilization in one form or another since the dawn of time. The left cannot claim credit for those rules, didn't invent them, and thus doesn't care about them. So they're not emphasized and sometimes are directly and purposefully de-emphasized. For example, a woman in New York Uh, named Christina Yuna Lee, was murdered inside her apartment by a homeless drifter just last week. The Daily Mail has some of the details. It says a homeless serial criminal accused of murdering an ad creative after following her into her apartment, um, knifed the woman 40 times with one of her own knives, and had a sexual motive for doing so, a court heard. 
Asamad Nash was charged with sexually motivated burglary by prosecutors on Monday. As was revealed, his victim, Christina Yuna Lee, was found topless in the bathtub of her Chinatown apartment on Sunday. The charge suggests a possible motive for the brutal murder, which shocked NYC and raised fresh questions about New York State's bail reforms after it was revealed that Nash was a serial criminal on bail for robbery when he allegedly uh, did the killing. Well, of course he was on bail. That's the detail you can always count on finding in any of these stories about violent scumbags randomly assaulting or killing innocent people. They're always on bail. Now, it turns out that Nash had a lengthy rap sheet stretching back years. He's been a violent, worthless societal leech for a long time. But here are the highlights from just uh, the past year. It says, quote, according to court records accessed by DailyMail.com, Nash has been arrested four times in the last year alone. His rap sheet included misdemeanor charges of assault, intentional damage to property, harassment, resisting arrest, both attempted and successful escape from police officers, and selling a fare card. Three of these cases remain open, and he has appeared in court on numerous occasions. He was set to appear again before a judge on March 9th on the assault, harassment, and intentional damage to property charges. Now, it doesn't matter how often this sort of thing happens. The left will keep pushing for things like bail reform, ensuring that more and more violent criminals are put back on the street even after they've been arrested, because these rules are not their rules. They quite sincerely feel more outrage about Joe Rogan saying a naughty word than they do about a woman getting stabbed to death in her apartment by a drug-addled vagrant, not only because the vagrant's race makes him still a victim according to their narrative, but also because the vagrant didn't break any rule that they invented. He violated a different code, the legal code, for one, but also the moral code written in our hearts by natural law and codified by every human civilization since time immemorial. They don't care about that. What matters most is their rule book, which they came up with and which they add to every day and whose violators they believe should pay the harshest penalty of all. Hey, listen, hit the subscribe button. Do it right now. I demand it. And I thank you for your compliance. It is somewhat appreciated.